San Francisco in the Bay Area in California to shoot Gypsy Gentleman number three. Our last episode talked about the birth of the tattoo industry after the Second World War in the United States. And this episode is dedicated to the American tattoo renaissance. Starting in the 1970s, a lot of American tattoo artists started to look to the East. They looked towards especially the Japanese tattooers for a new aesthetic. They started to study the large body composition and the more attentive detail of the Japanese tattooing. They had private studios, they did larger body work, and they started to evolve artistically, and it created a whole new wave of tattooing in the United States. Now, this was a big change for American tattooing. It brought a whole new demographic of clients into the studio and it started to put into the press and into popular culture images of much larger, more beautiful tattoos. And a lot of people across America started to open their imagination about what tattooing could be. They started to see it as something that was viable in their life. So tattooers throughout the country started to emulate what was going on in San Francisco. But really, up until the early 1990s, everyone thought of San Francisco as like the heartland, the core. This was the cradle of tattoo civilization. We're going to visit the Asian Art Museum and we're going to try and get the same inspiration that those early San Francisco artists and the Japanese artists got from some of the beautiful Asian art. We're going to visit Warhorse Tattoo in Berkeley, my friend George Campisi's studio, my friend Jason Kundel is going to come down and we're going to take you over to the Musée Mécanique and we're going to introduce you to some of the cool collections of the, the old fortune telling machines to give you a little flavor of the carnival. And then we're going to introduce you to an old Belgian dog sport in Oakland, which has taken hold also here in the Bay Area. This has always been a bastion of forward thinking. We're gonna try and transport you into that time in our early San Francisco when tattooing was electric. We'll lay down for a while. Lay down. Here we are in Oakland, California at St. Rock's, a Belgian ring sport club run by my good friend Francis Metcalf. What's up, Fran? Marcus! How are you? How are you? Come on in. 
What exactly is Belgian ring sport? So all the ring sports, and there's French ring sport, and Belgian ring sport, and then there's Mondial ring sport. And all these ring sports are like a track and field for dogs. Okay, and it originates in Europe? It started in Belgium, it spread to France, and now it's spread all through Europe. Ring sport is a way to test the qualities of working dogs. So a working dog, and in this context, I don't mean a herding dog, but a police dog. And a working dog needs to do certain things and they have to be able to uh, use their mouth to grip. Um, they have to be able to retrieve. They have to be able to use their nose. They have to be able to be a, have a certain amount of athleticism to climb walls, jump past your fences, um, jump over drainage ditches, and ring sport was a way to standardize all of these things and to come up with a competition to sort out who has the best working dog. So, what's about to happen here is Scott is the decoy. We call him the decoy in English, but they're called the homme de tac in French and that's the new word for it. Before that, they were called the Apache, which was named after a Parisian street gang. The, the decoy is, is born to lose. So he has to lose and make himself seem smaller in the training so the dog feels more confident. Okay. He's the dog's sparring partner. Nice. So, and and you can see he's all, he's all dressed up right now, cool. ready to go. No dog could bite through there. Okay. Of course, they're not trained to bite the face, feet, or hands. Okay, but well, I think uh, everybody wants to see some uh, attack and release. Yeah, let's sure. do it. Traditionally, what breed of dog? Belgian Malinois. They're, they're gaining fame right now because there was a Belgian Malinois on SEAL Team 6 when they okay. took out Bin Laden. So more and more people know about them, but this is the, the hidden martial art behind that type of training. Very cool, very cool. And so how many years have you been training dogs in ring sport? I've been in ring sport for 20 years now. The most important thing about dog training, three principles, timing, consistency, and motivation. You have to know what motivates a dog, you have to have good timing in order to communicate with them, and you have to be consistent with your communication. So these are the, th the three principles that guide our training process. Hmm. And there's nothing more grounding than working with a dog. You know, I mean, dogs are in the moment, and the trainer has to have that discipline to stay in the moment, stay joyful in the moment while they're training the dog. And uh, it really, it brings people together. It's something that, that uh, you only master when you get some gray hair and you get a little older, but mm -hmm. uh, you need the youthful energy coming into the clubs too in order to keep things fresh and to develop the talent. Well, I love you, man. I love you too. Yeah, uh, it's <laughs> super cool that we could do this together. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, bro. It's really awesome to see you. Yeah. Ah. We're going to visit the Asian Art Museum. We're very lucky to go there because it's one of the premier museums in San Francisco. And out of that experience, together, we're going to draw three tattoos that are Asian inspired.
I kind of like sometimes to use the sculptural image more than the traditional tattoo image. I think for like a one shot tattoo, it'd be cool just to do a, like this head and then like a simpler wall of fire and muted reds with a bird head in it, but not the full phoenix. Right. You know what I mean? But I like the really straight flames coming off of that. What do you think? I think that's the winner. Yeah. Oh, the eyebrows on that guy are great. And just the, just sort of the it's curve. A, almost like a Kieran. I mean, minus the reverse of the neck and everything. Yeah. The curve, just like Look the nose the nails curve. are all set back in these weird kind of flat fingers. Yeah. It, you could, you could almost see how it would just make such a good, clean tattoo, you know? It's just, it, it could translate so easily into just like this nice traditional dragon. Like the teeth are laid out perfectly, and the eyebrows, and the high nose with the arch, and the angry eyebrow, and stuff like that. Had a few spikes on the eyebrow, and shit, that thing is just pretty much ready to go. Begging to be tattooed, you mm -hmm. know? You grew up around here? No, technically not. I grew up in Los Angeles, and moved to San Francisco when I was 18. And then um, spent two years here, took a two-year break in San Diego, and then moved back. And started doing the same thing we all did out of the house in San Diego. And after butchering people for a while, I found a friend, Paco mm -hmm. and Adrian, who steered me in the right direction. This was like 91, 92, so this was right when Primal Urge just opened, Tattoo City was just killing it. I mean. It's a pretty magical place for tattoos. Yeah. And I just got lucky enough that like a friend basically told me, this is where you want to be. You know, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by super good people, super, I mean, everyone was young at that point in it. Mm -hmm. But obviously some people were older than me to teach me stuff, but everyone, everyone kind of went on to do great things. So I think I just happened to fall into this crowd that people were so hungry, you know? so hungry and, and so driven. the competition of that environment? The competition, I mean, obviously San Francisco at that time, like the whole Bay Area, I mean, you had to, you had to fucking make some good shit. I mean, not only yeah. just to like, I mean, just in order to sort of be subpar, you had to make some good shit. I mean, I, th I think in general, sort of, there's peaks and valleys, obviously, through your career, you know, like there's times where you're and when you look back, not that I've been tattooing forever, but you look back over like a few year period and you think like, wow, I was kind of doing some stuff that didn't need to be in all those tattoos during those couple of years, you know? But it's, for I think example? it's- For example? Well, for example, like I think when I got really busy for a little bit, I kept um, going with formulas, you know? Like just relying on sort of old formulas and oversaturating things and just putting lots of putting too much into each tattoo, not in, too much into the drawing, but too much into each subject matter, you know, like there's just so many different layers and this and that and, and tweaky details rather than like the right tweaky details in the subject matter, you know, it was just all over the place and stuff. And I feel like after a while, I've like the last few years, I feel like I've really tried to refine the drawings to the point where it's like stuff is reading really nicely and the stuff that is a little tweaky is maybe fine. And like what fades away from the tweak over the 20 years is not gonna matter. And you know, the tweak that you do see, it's like, oh, that's a really cool extra little touch, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, I've gotten to really like, like the way that those things hold up over time. Super cool. I love all the Netsuke and Obe. Oh, sort of great. Traditional status symbols and like the opium pipes and stuff. Most nice. of these images are pretty much ready to go as a tattoo. Oh, yeah, it's just yeah. little flash sculptures. Yeah. Yeah, these are great. So how would you do that? Say, say you do that as your tattoo for I today. I think that one, the one with the, the mat. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, I'd vary the composition a little bit, but I think that's pretty much it, you know? Mm -hmm. I think I'd keep the mat in there just so I can get like something that's a little bit more like an earthy tone in there. Yep. And then that way I can get a little crazier with the palette on the octopus and the fish. You know, mm -hmm. Really kind of contrast each other. The little shells and everything in it? Oh yeah, well you know me. I, yeah. got, I got to do the tweaky detail, come on. Of course. Principally like you've been a San Francisco tattooer or a Bay Area tattooer. Uh, uh, close to 20 years now. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's um, in my 19th year and I've Pretty much excluding that year away, did it all in San Francisco. That's where I started. I, I really just kind of fell into it. You know, I, I had started getting tattooed already in Atlantic City. I was going to um, Tony Cambria Jr.'s shop, um, Tony the Pirate in Atlantic City, and getting tattooed by friends out of their house with like jailhouse shit. So New Jersey, Tony um, the Pirate. <laughs> so now you've been tattooing a little bit out of your house. You're trying to break into it. My first big break actually came from uh, working at Erno Tattoo in the Lower Haight on uh, Fillmore Street. Uh, and it was just, it was a great, a really, really good like introduction to it, you know. Um, You're lucky, you came at just the right time to the right place. Yeah, it was, I mean, and it really, I mean, I feel like my entire career shit's just kind of fallen in my lap. You know, I've been really spared having to knock on a lot of doors and, hey, please take me in, you know. So after that, you know, your street shop chops, where'd right. you go? After that, I was, uh, all that entire time I'd been getting all, pretty much almost all my tattoo work done at Everlasting. Like I just fell in love with that shop and, and uh, Mike had offered me a spot. And so I ended up taking that and uh, you know, where I felt like Erno's was really good for just, you know, learning to deal with fucking people and kind of troubleshoot some shit and, you know, just getting your street chop, chops down. You know, Mike really taught me a lot about, okay, this is how you fucking do a composition for a larger tattoo and, you know, where, where you want your focus to be and, you know, your palette, like everything. And it, and it was like, okay, now I got to get to work. And, and what was, I mean, the tragic thing is I probably worked there for three years and I had that horrible realization that I was just an atrocious tattooer. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And I was going to conventions and doing a lot of work and all that, but I'm like, dude, you've been tattooing a while now and you, you kind of fucking suck. It's time to shit or get off the pot, you know, like do it or quit, you know. And so I really started kind of, you know, diving into it. I got to fucking put up or get out, you know. I got to be worth sitting under this banner, you know. And so I really, you know, kind of put my head down and, all right, time to learn. And then right around that time, um, Jason Kendall and Eric Reith and Luke Stewart had opened up Seventh Son. And uh, they eventually offered me a spot. And it, and it was great because it was probably the first time, too, where I felt like, you know, I was actually going to work with peers versus going to work for, you know, someone that you would put up on a pedestal. And, you know, like going to work for your heroes. Now I'm going to work for my friends. I want to see you try and defend her when she's gone. When she's gone. Late last December, your love fell away and you couldn't remember where it had gone, where it had gone. Silence looking around every corner of the room. You seem so confused. Here, there was so much tattooing going on that I didn't get to put enough into my drawing time. How can stuff be simpler and read better? Like, you know, if I'm doing a back piece, how is this going to read fucking awesome from across the room or 20 feet away, but still get up close on it and see like all these levels of depth or detail or things like that. So, that's kind of one of the things that I really feel like I've been working on. Mm -hmm. um, is, it's more that. It's more, I guess, kind of refining the old tools, you know? Mm -hmm. It feels like you sort of, you learn all these techniques, you try all the new shit, and you go back to the old stuff that you know works, but then just trying to make the old stuff even better. So, for me, my tattoos, like what I like, I like stuff that just stays classic, you know? I, like, whether it's American, whether it's Asian, whether it's like old cholo stuff, like 
I like it to have a certain authenticity to it, you know? We've been trying now, we've been trying now. Oh, we've been trying now. I can't you know, one of the things that, that Micah told me really early on was, you know, stop looking at other people's fucking work. You know, you're never going to find your own voice if you're always looking to somebody else's shit for inspiration. Or if you want to draw a tiger, get a picture of a fucking tiger. Don't get a picture that someone else drew of a tiger. And uh, it was the truth. At the time, I was like, yeah, but I'm a tattooist. I need to study tattoos. And I think there's truth in that as well, you know. Especially when you're learning. You don't know what the fuck you're doing. you got to see how someone who knows what they're doing, how they would do it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't ever break away from that, you're just going to be recycling the same shit over and over again. Especially now that tattooing is blown up as much as it has. I kind of feel like now more than ever you do need an original voice because Amen. everyone can fucking do it and with the internet all the information's there. You know, and it's now the like, machines come ready to do a good tattoo. Oh, yeah, when we started amazing. it was like people will give you misinformation. <laughs> totally. Like no you don't want the sharp pen down man, you flip that around. <laughs> no, it's the truth. You know, so yeah, I mean you need to, I feel like you know you need to to be original and to have your own thing and you know if you want to stick in it for the long haul. And, mm -hmm. In tattooing right now, I really, I really like tattoos that are looking like tattoos. Uh, it's sort of that full circle thing. And for me, a lot of what I've really been liking to do lately is almost taking Japanese compositions or like Asian composition tattoos and turning them into slightly more American, American tattoos of like a Japanese composition. So like a giant snake and skull done with all sort of Sumi wash background, but then really bold and traditional like you would an American tattoo, except this big instead of this big or whatever, you know? The canvas is the same. We're tattooing human bodies. And I'm sorry, the Japanese have been fucking working on a large scale for Very a hard. long time. They know? work hard. Yeah, and they work hard and they're fucking perfectionists, you know? But just in terms of placement of everything and just balance and all that, so even if I mean, I remember when I literally, when you know, I'd been working with Jason for a while. I was like, all right, I think what I want to do is I want to do my kind of creepy European-looking figure type shit, but with a Japanese sensibility in terms of composition and balance, because it's unparalleled. You can't fuck with it. You know, it's just it's so strong and graceful, and it's such a great balance of the two. You know, there's a lot of strength, but it's very delicate. And but I hear the devil, devil, devil. I do feel good about sort of like where I'm at. I feel like there's plenty more to do, and I've there, certainly I've come a long way since humble beginnings of ruining people's lives from a San Diego apartment building. I feel like, you know, when I got into tattooing, I'm sure I was part of the generation that all the old guys were like, these fucking kids, there's too many people getting into it. So, in one sense, part of me feels like it's the same thing going on and on, you know? On the other end, I feel like, you know, we have a culture that's, you know, very much about instant gratification of right now and, and uh, yeah, they don't appreciate the slow process and that it does take a long time to learn all this shit. And if you care about it, you know, this, I just feel like you can't be a fucking vampire sucking off it. Like, you got to give something back, you know. There was something in the way that she you know, I really feel like tattooing is a business, though, that you reap what you sow. And, you know, if you put a lot of work into it, you get a lot out of it. And, um, and if you don't, you don't. My name is Jason. This is my buddy Kellen. He was nice enough to come out and get tattooed for the Gypsy Gentleman. Thank you so much. I love it. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. My name is George Campisi of Warhorse Tattoo in Berkeley, California. 
My new friend, Miss Amelia, from the San Francisco's Asian Art Museum, was good enough to come out today to get tattooed and supported for Gypsy Gentlemen. Just wanted to say thank you for coming out. Thank you so much, I love it. Awesome. My name is Marcus, this is my friend Anthony. I was good enough to come in today and get a really cool Fudo Mio from the statue on his leg. And I really appreciate your coming to support the Gypsy Gentleman. Hey, I appreciate you calling me. It looks great. I'm really happy with it. Cool, man. Good man. Hope I see you down the road. All right. We're on Fisherman's Wharf here in San Francisco. We came down here to visit the Musée Mécanique. It happens to be the world's largest collection of antique player pianos and fortune telling machines. Right up my alley. I'm gonna go check it out right now. For participating in the Gypsy Gentleman, my friend Seth Safari has handmade this machine especially for you. Oh, shit. So thanks a lot, brother, for being part of it. That is fucking awesome. Man. Very cool, man. Awesome, Marcus. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Seth Safari. River that leads to the ocean. The ocean that sets man free. I'm leaving today, I'll miss your embrace But there's a boat out there waiting for me So darling, give me one last kiss I don't want no tears, girl, now hush The open sea, she's calling me I just wanted to take a minute to thank everybody who supported the Gypsy Gentleman. I'm really touched by all the people who emailed and, and wrote and told us how much they're enjoying our series. And if you really want to help us, what you could do is follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Tell all your friends about it. And you never know, I might be filming in your city soon. I'll see you down the road. Like you have to think in the long term. You take that shit on when you're not qualified to do it. You fuck that person up. They have kids now, and they're telling their kids, look at this shitty tattoo I got. You never get a tattoo. Yeah, I think I did a couple of those. Oh, I'm sure I did it too, you know? But I also stuck around long enough that they can still find me, and hopefully I can fix it the fuck up. You like, know? hey, George. And you're like, oh, hey. What's up? I can't remember your name, but I can certainly remember that tattoo. Holy I can see the keloid poking through the shirt. Like, oh, fuck. But it's basically the same story. I was a punk rocker. I like skateboarding or spray painting or, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember that moment for myself. Yeah. 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 Numerous I mean, tropical fish haircuts that I thought I looked like some, like, the Joker or something, and I just looked like, you know, some <laughs> horrible clown mm -hmm. lost from the circus. Yeah, very I mean, confused like, times. Yeah, they were super confused, but good. I mean, punk rock had that energy. Yeah. 
that doing has that energy. Maybe that's the common link. It's amazing how many of us have the same stories. You know, it's like we have all... the same damn tattoos and the same oh, stuff yeah. in our living rooms. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and somehow same we all. Shirt. You're like, we oh all... yeah, are we outfitters? Yeah, <laughs> but I was the only one. <laughs> yep. We all seem to like taxidermy. <laughs> right? And you yeah. know, it's another coincidence. We all seem to like getting blowjobs from girls. <laughs> it's crazy. Who would have thought? Because who the fuck am I to say if you know somebody wants you know a fucking hippo and a tutu on them? If I can make it into a, a good tattoo that's going to hold up over time, that's up to them. They got to live with it. That's what know? I was thinking of getting from you. There you go. That's what cool. I'm saying. Yeah, nice. I don't know if I would have thought in the beginning that I'd ever have a job where I worked so much or even had as many books in my library, you know, as I do now. But I'm certainly happy for it. And it's Except when you're moving. Except for moving, <laughs> and then it's like you know, all your best friends are like, Jason's moving. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be in uh, Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> I uh, broke both my ankles yesterday. It's a fast heal. And next week I should be okay. In terms of moving your 750 crates of books, I'm out. Sorry. Not so much. Your truck key. Yeah. I see. Rest. Sure, sure, work. Oh. Okay. Really Speedy. <laughs>graveyard that I'm standing in is called Juan Soldado and uh, the graveyard is built around the grave of a Mexican soldier Juan Soldado who was killed right here uh, he ran from the bottom of the field down here during the war between Mexico and California and was shot down at this point so a shrine was built to commemorate his death and he's become a saint the entire graveyard was built around this shrine this is a sacred cemetery and uh, it's right in the heart of Tijuana this ground that we're standing on and this whole area has a really good feeling and uh, it's really inspiring.